you need to think of food as that really important thing that fuels your body. It allows us to be more productive. It's how we can alter our health, how we can train harder, how we can get stronger, how we can be better people. I've been meaning to reach out to you for ages. I'm pretty crap at cooking. I have like yeah. three meals in my chef's repertoire and yeah. you are my best friend that knows how to cook food. You're the, the, the Pete Black Belt, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in food making. Yeah. And uh, I just wanted to get you on because I don't think it's just me. I think a lot of the, especially the guys, yeah, um, struggle, especially people that want to do fitness meal prep. Mm -hmm. They just don't have a very good range of foods. And I wanted to bring yeah. you in to your specialist subject, making, making stuff taste good. I wanted you to yeah. take us through the principles and then maybe give us some recipes as well. Yeah, absolutely. I'm really looking forward to it. And um, in terms of the sort of the meal prep and the fitness side, I used to compete as a runner, um, 800 meters. So for me, that's where it all really started with making delicious food, like because I'm such a foodie and always have been. It's how do I how can I create amazing food that fuels my needs as an athlete, but also fuels my needs as someone that's obsessed with food. So I've got quite a quite a good experience in this. I love it, man. So where do we start? What's the what's the principles we need to understand before we can even get into it? Yeah, I think for me, shopping and stocking your cupboard for success is a great way to start because I think in terms of, let's start with stock cupboard essentials. Like so many things with a recipe, you really only ever need to buy the fresh stuff. If you've got an amazing selection of like spices, herbs in the cupboard, tins, chopped tomatoes, beans, your rices, pastas, and pulses and stuff, and in the freezer, like frozen veggies, things like that, you've always got a meal to hand. Like I could, for instance, open the cupboard, grab some pasta, make a delicious tomato sauce using tinned tomatoes, some garlic, flake through some tuna and put some frozen broccoli in. And I've just made like an amazing meal without even going to the shops. So I think the best place to start is sort of stocking the cupboard for success. And I can certainly share details on what I guess my stock cupboard essentials are but yeah olive oil a balsamic vinegar red wine vinegar selection of herbs selection of spices all dried um what are the herbs and spices because people always talk about that and then i just look yeah. at the far corner of my kitchen my housemates are pretty good foodie i right. just look at the far corner and it's just loads of words that i don't really know what they are yeah I, I mean there's so much choice but for me if if i had to have core spices cumin ground coriander chili powder turmeric garam masala i think there's five solid ones you can go down your zatars and razel hanouts and stuff if you want to but i think with those five you can do so much with them and then for herbs probably like oregano you can use it in so many italian things if you're just making a tomato sauce just chuck a bit of that in it's going to taste better dried thyme um probably some dried sage for your sunday roasts and stuff like that and i would say to be honest the oregano is the secret one for me. I use it in so many different things. You're putting it on and your then, cereal in the morning. Putting on my cereal, putting on my put a cumin on my porridge. Um, I've done that before instead of cinnamon, and it was half, like by accident. And you don't want to try it. Um, and then it like obviously pasta, rice, and if anyone's interested in adding more fiber to their diet, just go for the whole whole wheat or whole grain alternatives. Sort of slower release of energy. Um, and then in the freezer, always got frozen peas. Always like a bit of frozen broccoli and spinach, and they contain the same amount of nutrition as fresh. And even like peas are actually fresher. Um, sorry, how do I describe that? Yeah, they are because they hold their nutrition more because they're frozen with an hour of picking. So if you go to the shops and buy a pack of fresh peas, they've been in there five days, you're getting more nutrition out of a frozen pea. So don't go thinking frozen fruits and vegetables aren't as nutritious because they are and in some cases even even more so with the frozen spinach do you get the little pucks yeah and in terms of value for money you know what it's like everyone's tried to wilt some spinach and you put a bag in and you end up with like a teaspoon worth of spinach and it costs you about 253 quid for the bag but in the in the freezer you get way more weight for your money so it's actually it's a lot better value and obviously it's not going to go out a date in a, in a hurry okay so that's what we've got that kind of stays in the cupboard and you need to yeah. keep replenishing that what about like yeah. so I'm, I'm going into the shop where yeah. where do i go where do you start i think 
where you need to start is before you go to the shop, make a shopping list. So many people get it wrong and they go in without an idea of what they want. So for me, the whole shopping experience starts at home. Generally, for me, I'll do a Sunday night and I'll think, where am I this week? Chances are at the minute at home. But when things are normal, it's like, oh, maybe on Monday I'm at home, but Tuesday I've got an event or something. So let's plan a meal that I can do for two days that day. And I've just got a quick fix, eat the leftovers or reheat them. And then maybe Wednesday again, you might end up doing another batch. So I think planning your food, not around necessarily what you fancy eating, but what's my week looking like? Which days have I got time to cook? Which days haven't I got time to cook? And that, that just helps take the stress out of cooking. So the answer to your question of where do I start in the supermarket is the top of the list of what it is you're going to make that week. And if you've got a really well stocked cupboard of the spices, the herbs, chopped tomatoes and things, generally you're only ever going to need to go to the fresh aisle for your proteins and potentially the fresh veg because the rest you should have in the cupboard. Got you. Okay. So what are we doing when we're selecting meats? How do you, what's your rule for selecting meats? Okay. I mean, depending on what your nutritional needs are, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a nutritionist, but I have a bit of an understanding of it. Obviously things like a chicken breast is leaner than chicken thigh. Um, and for me, I always like to buy quality. So we live in a world now where it's easy to buy really cheap protein like chicken and things like that. And my view on it is I'd rather eat less meat, but of a higher quality. Say I had a, a budget for meat, whatever, 30 quid for the week. I'd rather eat four days a week and go the others meat free than eat seven days a week on a lower quality. So I, I do try and get the best quality I can afford. And what does that mean? Are you going to a local butcher's? Are you, are you just happy going into Asda or whatever and M&S and getting the more expensive range? Yeah, I'll go to M&S and I know it's all British in there and it's all really responsibly sourced and farmed. And for me, British, I think is key. Like we need to be supporting British farmers, not just with our meat, but also the veg. And I think a massive thing now is like carbon footprint and so many people are going, say, they're cutting out meat to have a, a lesser impact on the environment. But if you're buying avocados that have been flown in from the other side of the world and you're not eating seasonal British food, you might eat asparagus in December. But if that's been flown in from Egypt, you might have been better off buying some chicken that was raised in the UK because it's traveled less air miles. So I think I'm eating with the season. So when I go into the shop, I've got m and I'm going to be thinking, what's in season? We're coming up to asparagus. Make sure it's British. Jersey roll potatoes. I think we should be eating the best of British all year. And that way you get the best taste. You get the sweetest strawberries in the summer and you get the nicest sort of, um, how do I say it? Just eat, eat British food and you can't go wrong. And then I think educating yourself on what's into season. So for me, spring's coming up. We've got asparagus and like Jersey Royals, like I say. So you can get really excited then in, I say excited, I geek out over food. But then I, I traveled the UK in 2019 and met different producers of all this amazing food. And I was in the Isle of Wight eating these tomatoes that had just come into season. And it was like eating sweets. They were so good. So if we can start to get some understanding of what's in season, I can share all of this detail after after the podcast. Awesome, man. All right. So we've gone to the shops. We've started to pick yeah. some stuff up. Obviously, we're going to... You're going to go through some recipes towards the end and yeah. then we'll work back and people can yeah. make shopping lists from that. What yeah. what are some of the things that people need to steer clear of that aren't necessarily the obvious ones? Like, obviously, don't absolutely hammer the confectionery aisle, but are there any yeah. other things that people shouldn't be putting in their trolleys that they sometimes do? Okay. I mean, that, that's a tricky one. Everyone's sort of different and I wouldn't want to say don't buy this, don't buy that. It really comes down to, I think, just... Just having some self-control because it's the confectionery aisle that kills most people. And I guess my my general thing is if it's not in the house, I can't eat it. So it's if it's too tempting, then maybe just try and steer past it. But that's what comes down to if you've created a list and you go in with the intention of having the list in front of you and ticking off everything on there. I think it's going into shop without a plan. It's like you can't score without a goal. If you haven't got yeah. a goal in mind, you're not going to get it right. So if you've got the things on the list, get that, that and that, then you're not going to obviously spend as much as well because food costs money. So 
if you stick to what you want, we shouldn't be wasting any food. There's a massive amount of awareness now around food waste and the amount of things people, I can give you some details on how to store food properly, make it last longer, but people are throwing food in the bin. Just imagine you're throwing money in the bin. Like how many times do you buy a pack of peppers, two of them will go a bit soft and they end up in the bin or the best one is rice. You make a massive thing of rice because you're not so sure on how much to make. And it either goes in the bin that night or you put it in the fridge with good intent. And then next lunchtime, you're like, can't be asked with this, straight in the bin. And the easiest way we can all reduce our carbon footprint is to actually stop throwing food in the bin. People don't realize the environmental impact it has on, on, on the environment going into landfill. So I guess a few tips on how to avoid food waste, things like herbs. You buy herbs for one recipe, but it might just be half a bunch. You can make herb ice cube trays. So just chop up your fresh herbs in an ice cube tray, fill them with water, put them in the freezer. Then if you've made a curry, a stew or a soup, you're literally just dropping fresh herbs into them. Um, rice and things like that. We're all guilty of making too much. Chill it as quickly as you can. Put it in a window or something, let it cool. Pop it in the fridge or the freezer. If it's in the fridge, eat it the next day. And you just have to be confident to reheat it. But if you go to other countries like China, like everyone knows egg fried rice, that is made with cold rice. They cook it the day before. It has to be cold to reheat it in the pan. So it's just thinking about how are other people cooking around the world. And that for them is normal to use a rice to reheat it. Whereas in the UK, I think people are scared of it. Terrified of it, yeah. Yeah, massively. And I mean, it can give you food poisoning, but if you just heat it until it's piping hot and steam coming off it, generally, if you put the knuckle of, of, of your knuckle in and it's too hot to touch, it's, it's sort of done. Um, and other things like chilies, you buy a pack of five chilies, put them in the freezer and you can actually grate them onto things um, or you can drop them into a curry or whatever. So we should be making the most of everything we've got. This is something I've thought about. What is the minimum viable kitchen utensil equipment? Pots, yeah. pans, knives, Pant. things. What what do we need in this for this setup? Brilliant answer. I think for all the recipes I do, I want to make it what well, my passion is to simply inspire people to cook from scratch. And I think there are so many barriers to cookery. How many times you've probably done it, you open a book and it says, get out your, your stand mixer. And then you need your mini food processor and uh, a hand mixer or something like that. And you think, well, I haven't even got the kit, never mind the ingredients. So I always try and keep everything I do so simple that a chopping board and a knife, a couple of baking trays, and for me, a large nonstick oven-proof frying pan is amazing because you can do everything in there from like a peri-peri chicken. You can start it on the hob, put it in the oven. Um, so a large nonstick frying pan and then probably a small saucepan scrambled eggs and all of that and a larger one to do your rice and things so chopping board and a knife and i would say invest in a good knife if you've got a good knife it makes chopping things easier the sharper the knife the easier it is to cut through what's a good knife what sort of uh, price range are we are we looking at i use global knives and they that's a brand that i use and they are everything from professional kitchens and you could pay between 60 or 150 pound for a knife but if you can get just one or two good knives, like a, a larger, it's called a chef's knife, you can do so much with it. And if you actually look after it, sharpen it, take care of it, it will last for years and it will make your job in the kitchen so much easier. Cool. My uh, my housemate, Toby, got a a pan like you're talking about, which is yeah. the whole thing is, is iron. And uh -huh. when he got it, he was oiling it like a cricket bat. Yeah. He was getting it, and he's like putting oil on it and stuff. Uh -huh. I'm pretty sure he took it to bed with him at one point. Oh, and right. Yeah, I know. I know. I haven't used it. Uh, yeah. No, but I, I know that you can go really sort of deep and uh, mm. complex on those as well. But you're saying just that as your as your nice simple makeup for what you need. Yeah, I think. For, yeah. So a quick recap of that: large nonstick frying pan that can go in the oven because you can do everything in there from like soups, stews, stir fries, curries. It's so, so versatile. Um, casseroles can do it because it can finish in the oven. A couple of baking trays, large saucepan, small saucepan, chop and board and a knife. And if you want to go to it, I would say a mini food processor, but everyone's got a neutral bullet now. So you can just make pestos in there, obviously smoothies, different sauces. So that's actually a really good bit of kit that has be 
everyone got it to make smoothies in, but it's really quite good to, to do everything else as well. No need for a ceramic pot or a slow cooker? Um, do you know what? If you're meal prepping, that could be a good idea. I don't generally use the slow cooker so much, but if people want to do batch food, I'd, if a slow cooker is a good investment. It's just having the space. It depends how much room you've got because for me my thing started as I, I moved to London I was living in the smallest flat you can imagine and I didn't have any room for anything so my recipes just naturally developed in the basic equipment and simple easy to get hold of ingredients got you okay so what about freezing and storing food effectively yeah I think stuff anything you put in the freezer first of all label it because Half the time you go and you think, when did I put that in there again? Like, Oh, so we need some Tupperware. We also need maybe uh, some yeah. Post-it notes. Yeah, I would say get some sticky notes. And for me, I think freezer bags are amazing because you can put things in, even if it was like, say, curry, you can put it in a freezer bag, flatten it down, and you can actually stack them up on top of each other. And you've it just makes you make the most of your space. Tupperware is great, things like rice. Um, so, yeah, some good freezer bags, some Tupperware. And I would say always label everything um, and put the date on it. That's the key because stuff like rice, you want in there for like a month. And generally food, I would say, use it within three months. But I think people are guilty of cooking loads of food. So, oh, God, it's great. I'll pop it in the freezer. And their freezer just keeps filling up and up and up. And they're never getting anything out to defrost. So for me, I almost you have intent thinking make a note right i've got three portions of chili which nights am i actually going to eat them don't just have it there for emergencies like use the freezer plan think oh, on friday night on my meal plan i'll be eating frozen chili that i made last week and make sure you're actually using the stuff and then when it comes to storing things in the fridge i always think look at how the supermarket stocks the food they're the experts if they've put the peppers in a pack keep them in the pack. Oh, it was in the fridge in the shop as well. So I'll keep it in the fridge here. So salad and stuff in the bottom, Sight, tightly seal the top if you want it to last longer. Obviously any protein and stuff in chicken, meat on the bottom shelf. reason you do that is because if you put it on the top, if there's a hole in the pack, you don't want any of the juice dripping out and contaminating everything else. And also use your senses as well, because a lot of things you can actually eat a little bit longer than it might say on the pack. So don't necessarily, you've had a yogurt open for one day longer than it says, like a Greek yogurt. It's probably going to be okay. Does it smell okay? Does it look okay? It probably is. Got you. What about reheating food? Mm. Because okay. there's there's a few sort of uh, obstacles to try and navigate here. Reheating food in plastics, we've got some a lot of concerns around BPA or how it affects your endocrine system. That's before you get onto the taste side of stuff and making something not taste like ass again. So, so for what you've mentioned there, for me, I, my first concern is taste. And the stuff you're talking about, I'm fully aware of it, but I'd rather it didn't taste like ass. Because <laughs> if you've gone to the effort of making something delicious, even just a simple chili or something, for me, I always think, reheat it i like to do it in a pan if it's something like a, a batch cook but it's it is easier in the microwave but i would say decant it from the the tupperware mm -hmm. for the health reasons but it does generally taste like plastic doesn't it when you heat it back up and then it's a bit disappointing when you're eating your dinner so i think it's just making sure food's piping hot and that'll be steam coming off it and when you're reheating things, just keep it stirring constantly. If you're reheating things in a pan, don't necessarily put it into a piping hot pan. To keep it and just heat it up gradually. For me, if I was reheating a portion of curry or a chili, probably give it 10 minutes. Just let it simmer, let it come up to the boil, and then it's it's going to be done. But just needs to be piping hot all the way through. Got you. So when we're working with those freezer bags that you were talking about mm. before, is it possible to get food out of them without having to reheat them in the bag? Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. You can just sort of like snip the top off and almost knock it out, out type thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Knock out. But then if you're reheating food from the freezer, I would say defrost it overnight first. So if you've got, we just use chili as a good example in a freezer bag, pop it in the fridge the night before you're going to eat it. And then it will be defrosted by the time you come to get it out and reheat it. So it'll be quicker and safer to reheat. Um, 
so it will come straight out of the bag. Just pop it in the fridge overnight. A good option for the people who are really going to be anal about their endocrine system and about concerns mm. to do with the plastics. Um, Pyrex and a couple of other companies have now started to make glass Tupperware that are still yeah. sealable. Um, and you can use those. Okay. Actually, that's something that I would say uh, that, that I would add to your minimalist kitchen would, toolkit. Yeah. It would be like a glass Pyrex bowl, perhaps with, on with, that. with a, a, the, the plastic lid, and it just means you can put some peas and a dollop of water in and throw it in for yeah. four minutes, and you know that that's yeah. going to turn them over. The same goes for any sort of mash that needs heating up, stuff like that. Yeah. That's a great shout, actually. I think I didn't think of the storage stuff to get hold of, but that is good. And do you know what? They last longer, and it's it's you could get a Pyrex, and it'll last you. I mean, God, I go home, and my, there's still Pyrex there that was there when I was when you were a kid. Yeah, and it, it lasts. <laughs> and I think the the impact on the environment of just buying plastic, so uh, it's an investment. It might cost a couple of quid more, but it will last longer. Your food will taste better, and it just looks a bit nicer, doesn't it? Got you. Okay, so meal planning in advance yeah what what how are we doing that are we just going to sit down at the start of the week and say right okay i need to cook on these days i need to not cook on these days but i, I don't know how hungry i'm going to be or mm. whether i fancy this on that day how do you navigate yeah. that right how do i navigate that i think you don't necessarily have to do all week at once some people might they feel the pressure oh i need seven days of food just do three days at a time do what works for you um and I think that's where if you've got an amazing stock cupboard, like we talked about at the start, I always do these things called like a two day dish. So everyone batch cooks a bolognese or something like that. But then actually, I don't want to eat bolognese three nights in a row. But what happens if I've got the bolognese, spaghetti bolognese on Monday, then I've got this massive batch and I go on Tuesday. Right. I know I've got some cumin in the cupboard. I've got some chili in the freezer and I've got some coriander ice cubes. I'm going to chuck that into a frying pan maybe throw an onion and a pepper in that's in the back of the fridge that needs using put some spices in some dried oregano drop in some coriander i've got the chili in there and you've turned last night's bolognese into tonight's chili and then maybe the next night you might go oh i know i'll buy some some tacos and i'll just fry that off and put in some kidney beans and make like a, a chili bean taco tostada thing maybe you can scoop some avocado on the top so it's how do you turn one meal into three meals for the next few days is a great great way to do it but that just comes down to having the right stuff in the cupboard got you how long in advance or what's the sort of maximum that you think we can cook in one go is that let's say it's a single guy or single girl cooking for themselves and they're maybe going to do sort of lunch or dinner for Mm. the next couple of days how much would you try and do at once because i have some friends that in the boy, the fitness industry who are yeah. trying to do seven days like sunday sunday evening is seven days of food yeah. created in one go do you know what i've never been one for doing that and i see things on instagram that say oh meal prep sunday i'm thinking you've actually just written a full day of the week off by doing that because they're literally the thing this hey it's just my opinion but on a sunday i don't necessarily want to spend five six hours preparing seven meals if you can get comfortable with cooking regularly, maybe you just need to plan for Monday and Tuesday and then spend half an hour on Wednesday. So have I think always just say, have a think. How much time does it is it going to take me to prep for seven days? It could be quite a lot of time. For me, I would say three days is probably a good amount. And then you wouldn't necessarily have to freeze anything. Then you don't have to go through the process of defrosting. So if it was a Sunday, you could comfortably make dinner on Sunday night, eat it on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And it's just thinking about how to turn those leftovers into a new dish the next day. So, for instance, I'm going to talk about like a homemade Zinger burger later, where you basically cornflake the chicken, uh, cornflakes, flour, egg, not breadcrumbs, cornflakes. You get the crispiest exterior, delicious in a, in a burger bun with like a a, a low fat yogurt and uh, sweet chili sauce dip, something like that. Then the next day, if you've got that chicken, you could make a lovely salad wrap and just get like a wrap, some fresh salad, shred that crispy chicken in and put some more of that yogurt sauce on the top. So it's like you say, keep it interesting and think about 
how you can turn it into something else. But you don't necessarily need to do seven days in a row. And also, how <laughs> fresh is the food going to be by the seventh day? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, that's a, I, I've never seen that done before. But to think about making a meal that becomes the base for another meal that becomes the yeah. base for another meal. I haven't thought about doing it like that, but it does make a lot of sense. I think it's a great one. And I think it really lends itself well to stuff that we do batch cook, which is generally like slower cook things, chili, bolognese, curry, because it's so easy to add different spices and stuff into there to totally transform it into something else. Got you. Uh, before we get into the recipes, what yeah. are some of the most common errors or any other errors that you commonly see people making in the kitchen or with meal yeah. prep or with anything else? Like, what, what do people need to stop doing? If you were to give a public service announcement of, let's like, stop doing this in the kitchen, what would it be? Stop overcooking fish. Because, <laughs> do you know what? People are so scared. And I don't get, I, hey, don't, I, I can't blame them because the education of how to cook in the UK isn't amazing. But I get a lot of messages and feedback. Oh, I always overcook my fish. How do I stop doing it? It's like, just don't put it in for so long. Like, you've got to think you can eat fish raw. You can eat sashimi. You can eat sushi. So if you're buying fresh quality fish, I, you can eat it slightly underdone. I think people are skip, they overcook chicken and it becomes dry. You can buy a meat probe if you really want to get anal to make sure it's cooked. But as soon as it's white and there's no pink, so don't overcook your proteins. You spend the most money probably on protein. Enjoy it. And also, I think seasoning. People need to learn to season their food properly because lack of seasoning, but also seasoning at the right time. So many people make something and they're pouring loads of salt on at the end but actually seasoning at different stages of the recipe and the cooking process completely changes the flavor. So if you season, say, chicken half an hour before you cook it, that salt is actually going to change the texture of the meat, also flavor the meat from the outside in, whereas if you're just pouring it on at the end, you're going to get a different thing. So don't overcook your protein. Don't, well, just basically learn to season your food and also taste as you go because everyone's palates are different. That's what I love about home cooking. You're not in a restaurant. You're in control. You can make it how you want. So if you like it a bit spicy, you can add more chili. If you like it more acidic, add more vinegar. So don't be scared to taste as you go. I'm trying to think what else people shouldn't do in the kitchen. Um, cool. It's a tricky one. I think just take your time. Like, Don't rush it. For me, I want to make food and cooking fun and enjoyable and people rushing the process. I've done live cook-alongs where I've got people who've got their pan and food in. Before I have, I'm like, hang on a second. Like, <laughs> like literally, I did this charity cook-along and a really nice group of six people. There's these two lads on the screen. I was just doing this really simple bacon pasta. Everyone else really engaged. What do we do next? I said, have you got your pan? He says, oh, I've got the bacon in. I'm like... So you're not even like just listen. And if you've got a recipe, read it. I think literally, mate. And we had a crumble. We, we, like, honestly, the basics. We did this strawberry and almond crumble. It was delicious. But theirs wasn't because they made, they started the crumble mix before we went. And they ended up with like a scondo. I'm thinking like, <laughs> and that's just classic example of not listening or reading. So for me, if I've got a recipe in front of me, mm -hmm. read it from start to finish. And I guess... This isn't what people shouldn't do. It's just a tip to get you into a good habit. Prep everything before you start cooking. So chop everything up, get everything out of the cupboard and just have it all ready to cook. And then it makes the, the cooking bit a little bit more enjoyable. Mm, yeah, that Don't is rush. right. I mean, dude, I, I, I'm so thoughtless with the way that I actually do stuff in the kitchen. Yeah incredibly thoughtful when it comes to my productivity systems yeah. and how I sit down at my desk on a morning and organize yeah. my Eisenhower matrix from urgent yeah. to important and all this sort of stuff. But uh -huh. the food, which is literally fueling my being to be able to do everything else that I decide in my life. Yeah. I'm like, uh, right. I'll see if I can listen to a podcast whilst uh -huh. I wash up, whilst I do this thing and maybe yeah. answer an email oh I, i've got a bit of time i'll ring someone while i'm like just throwing the same yeah. stuff that i always throw into a pan and um yeah I, I i get that respect respect the kitchen do you know what i think that what you've said is probably going to resonate with so many people i think 
you need to think of food as that really important thing that fuels your body. It allows us to be more productive. It's how we can alter our health, um, how we can train harder, how we can get stronger, how we can be better people. And give it, like you say, give it that respect for me. Do you know what it is? This is a great analogy with food and cooking. So many people think it's hard. It, they can't do it. I think everyone can. Everyone's got the ability in them to become an amazing home cook. And easiest way to describe it, we all start training in the gym. We're hitting it hard. We've just started, though. The first six weeks, you are aching. You're seeing no gains. But the first time you look in the mirror, maybe it's, oh, I've gained some muscle here. Or, oh, I've lost some weight. And then you want to go back for more because it starts to become addictive for me. And the feedback I get is the first time you make a recipe from start to finish, if you're in total novice cook and you taste it and you go, or maybe your girlfriend, your family, whoever go, bloody hell, that's delicious. And you put a smile on their face and yours. That's the moment, which is like when you put the muscle on in the gym where you go, do you know what? That was pretty easy. It was really nice. And it made people happy. Mm. I want to do that again. And it becomes like this habit. But I think exactly what you say treat it as something it is important and the more you do it and focus your attention on it the easier it becomes and the more fun you can have with it and for me i like i put the radio on like i put the radio i'm a bit old school like turn the dials and all of that um put put the radio on get everything out prepare it and just plan that time in as you would plan in your gym session you planned it into your day i imagine but a lot of people just cram that food in at the end as a, a means to an end very much a utilitarian approach i think people just yeah. see it as this is the thing that sadly i have to do before mm. i can put the stuff in my mouth to fuel the things that i want to do and um yeah. don mcgregor uh, the ex coo of social chain was on the show episode four and he said yeah. to me you do know that your brain and everything that your body is made of is built by the stuff that you put in your mouth. That's it. Yeah. And you don't realize the the connection is the cells in your body, the quality of the cells in your body yeah. is directly influenced by the food that you choose to eat. And there's like, dude, when I when I think back to to uni, and this maybe have been before your uh, food awakening yeah. as well. I, I I shit you not, there will have been weeks that I would have gone without a vegetable, like yeah. like weeks and weeks it's just madness isn't it and oh, it really is and do you know what i always say food is a joy and we are lucky enough to live in the the society that we're in to have access to amazing quality ingredients nutritional advice um it's all there in front of us and on it like there are people out there who don't have access to any food whatsoever so I feel that we should respect it even more because we do have the ability to go and buy something really, really good. We've got the ability that you could go on the internet now and find the health benefits of salmon, how to cook it, and a million different sources. Instant access to how to even cook the food that you can, you've got access to. So I think we've got to treat it with respect. And one thing especially I think we've found in lockdown the one thing we can control in the day is what we eat for dinner. Well, that's what I'm getting in my world of food. And it's something that I think in lockdown, people have started to do more and realized that is the one time in the day they can actually get together with a family and enjoy it as a social thing. So I think there's so much more to food that we need to think about than just fuel. Yeah. The, I mean, seeing it as a as the experience of making the food as a potential source of mm. pleasure or even the eating yeah. of the food, not just that it's tasty, but yeah. that in the same way as when you clean the house before your missus gets home because you know it's going to put you in the in yeah. uh, like her good books the the same thing can be done you can give pleasure and receive pleasure just through the act of making a nice meal again something else that i have don't. never never dipped into and do you know what really i think got me into food I, as a kid i would get in from school and i just have this obsession of how you can turn some raw ingredients into a meal and my parents work really hard and they work long hours and I would just get in from school and every night from about nine, eight, nine years old, I'd make dinner for my mum and dad and just to see the joy of putting the food down on the table that I'd made and they're eating it and they're smiling, we're all sat together and I thought, do you know what? It's not even about what's on the plate, that here together talking and having a good time and I think there's just so much more to food than the fuel. However, I would say when you're an athlete, because I know there'd be a lot of guys and girls listening to this that train hard, 
the volumes of food you've got to eat, it can become boring, but that's why you've got to make it taste good. Um, so interestingly enough, there was a good documentary on Amazon about the, the Tour de France and some of the teams and how the nutrition has changed. And now they have like Michelin star chefs that follow them on the tour with a food van. And they literally go off foraging, sourcing ingredients from local farms, dairies, cheese, because these cyclists, are, they haven't eat about eight, 9,000 calories a day. And they're like, you really think I'm going to eat 9,000 calories of boiled chicken and rice with no seasoning or flavor? So they're paying these Michelin star chefs to follow them. And uh, that's the key, I think, for anyone training. Keep it tasty. And then you'll be able to eat as much food as you need to, to fuel yourself. Mm, yeah, and I suppose on the converse of that as well, if you are needing to put yourself into a calorie deficit, that yeah. you can you can make food which is slightly cal more calorie sparse, more yeah. tasty and more appetizing. Yeah. You know, Everyone's Absolutely. kind of turned their nose up at a plate of cauliflower and broccoli and, yeah. and spinach a little bit, but I imagine if it was done by Chris Baber, it might taste a yeah. bit different. Well, I think that that's... <laughs> That's the thing to think about veg, because you mentioned when you're at uni, you weren't eating much of it. Vegetables are lower in carbs. Um, but the, if you think about your stomach, it's only one size. It doesn't know if it's, it, it's full. So things like the cauliflower is great for filling you up. But how do you make it tasty? And broccoli, well, for me, with broccoli, tiny splash of oil in the pan, some garlic, throw the broccoli in. You can put a bit of chili in there, splash of soy sauce, even a tiny drizzle of honey. And you've made like this sticky, sweet, salty, sort of caramelized broccoli, which could have just been boiled and boring. So it's how do you make this stuff more adventurous? And it just comes back to herbs and spices and stuff, you, stuff you've got in the, in the stock cupboard, Chris. Cool. What's the first recipe we're going to learn? Okay, so the first recipe is a really easy chicken boona because I think, I mean, hey, I love an Indian takeaway. I love it. My first job was in a Michelin star Indian restaurant in London. I've got such a passion for Indian food. And everyone has this association of Indian food unhealthy. It's from the Indian. You can make some delicious curry. So chicken boona, this is a great one for batch cooking. Really simple, really basic stock cupboard ingredients as well. You can do it with chicken thighs or breasts. If you're doing chicken thighs and anyone wanting to watch the calories, top tip for meat, trim off any visible fat and you're literally trimming off calories as you go so any white bits you snip it off but literally cook your onions about 10 minutes in olive oil until they're really nice and golden and that's going to add sweetness and depth of flavor some garlic some ginger and some chili goes in in with the chicken and then all you need is turmeric and a good curry powder sprinkle that in coat the chicken loads of tin tomatoes a good handful of peppers and literally just simmer that for 20 minutes until the chicken's cooked and the water sort of evaporated from, from the pan and then finish it off with lemon juice and coriander. That's really healthy. It's low in fat, high in protein, and you can obviously serve that with any rice that you want to, to serve it with. Top tip for basmati rice to get it perfectly fluffy. You always go for the absorption method, which is, say, one part rice to two parts water. So if you've got a mug, full mug of rice, Rinse it under a tap in a sieve until the water runs clear. That takes off the excess starch. Pour the rice into the pan with two mugs of water. So one part rice, two part water, lid on, lowest heat, 10 minutes, perfect every time. So that's a chicken boona. Simple, easy to get hold of ingredients. Have it for your dinner that night. Then you can definitely put that in the fridge or the freezer. And if you didn't fancy curry the next night, why don't you do like a a, a spicy chicken wrap you could toast up a little uh, tortilla you could shred in some salad some uh some cucumber some tomatoes mix some uh greek yogurt with mint sauce just out the fridge put it in and you've just made like a spicy tikka wrap for lunch the next day we should say the on your instagram which is at uh, Chris Baber, yeah. At Chris Baber, um, there'll yeah. be a breakdown of all of the different recipes that yeah. we're going through today. So for everyone that's listening, you don't need to write this down frantically yeah. or, or, or like I'll, keep I'll on rewinding or whatever. Yeah. Um, but you can have you can look at look at your Instagram while yeah. you're narrating and they're uh, rushing around the kitchen trying to get this yeah. all done. Okay, so we've got yeah. a chicken boon. And what's next? Um, well, we talked about this uh, sort of zinger burger fake away. I think the fake ways are great because it's the food we crave and love, isn't it? But you can make it healthy. So basically, we're going to take a lovely lean chicken breast, dip it in some flour, dip it in some egg, dip it in 
crushed up cornflakes is the secret ingredient here. And then, oh, sorry, let's go back a step. In the flour, put some smoked paprika. You can put some cumin. Any spices you've got, you could even use the heat to mix. Whatever you've got in the cupboard, you can put it in there. Then into the bread, uh, into the cornflakes, and literally bake it in the oven. No deep frying or anything like that. But so just on on a, a on a baking tray. On a baking tray, two hundred degrees. It'll probably take about twenty five to thirty minutes, depending on the thickness. But because you've got that um, egg and cornflake coat, and it keeps all the juiciness in the chicken, then literally toast up. You could do a brioche bun. You could do a whole wheat bun, whatever you want. Um, or you could go bunless if you want to drop the carbs, and then for like a healthy little sauce. Some Greek yogurt, you can just add a squeeze of honey, squeeze a lemon, and a little bit of mustard or sweet chili sauce, and just spread that in, and you've just made a delicious um, spin on a on a Zinger burger. Really crispy, and we talked about this one earlier. Just slice that chicken up the next day, and you can, again, put that through salads, or you could even reheat that and put it into, like, a, a rice dish. But you're just going to have this crispy, crumbed chicken which is pretty basic and it could lend itself to whatever way you want to go with it. How would you add uh, some extra filler in that, like a, like a wedges or a, or a, a veg? Yeah. How could you do some, can you propose some veg and some wedges Absolutely. or something that can go in the oven along with that? So it's just like in and I, done? hundred percent. So for me, sweet potato wedges, um, love them. Just cut, the, cut a sweet potato into sort of one centimeter thick wedges Tiny drizzle of olive oil, bit of seasoning. You can put any spices on you want. Put them in the oven for about Do you keep half the skin on or are you, uh, have you peeled it? I keep the skin on because there's a lot of nutrition in the skin. In terms of veg to go with it, you could make a really simple coleslaw. People might think coleslaw is difficult or whatever, but literally just shred up some cabbage really, really fine. That's where a sharp knife comes in handy. Maybe grate some carrot, a little bit of red onion, some Greek yogurt, squeeze a lemon juice, salt, pepper, and that is a delicious coleslaw. Perfect. I love it, man. Okay, so we've got chicken burger. We've got chicken booner. What's next? Yeah, um, we want to do this peri-peri chicken. So everyone loves peri-peri chicken. And for me, we talk about as well value. So buying a whole chicken is far more economical than buying just the breasts or the thighs. And you can spatchcock a chicken, which sound might sound complicated, but literally you flip the chicken over and just use a pair of scissors and you cut the backbone out and then you can just flatten the chicken out and then you make a marinade just with red wine vinegar, some olive oil, uh, some paprika and oregano and some chili, whiz it up, cover the chicken in it, pop it in the oven for 45 minutes or so until it's cooked all the way through. Spatchcocking the chicken speeds up the cooking time so much and you're going to get this like crispy peri-peri chicken skin. And that one would be perfect with the sweet potato wedges. But for me, I love to do like a spin on the matcha peas that you get in uh, Nando's. Classic frozen peas, take them out. Uh, you can use mint sauce from a jar or just a bit of fresh mint. Or you could even use the mint ice cube thing that we talked about. Salt, pepper, a little bit of chili. If you've got some creme fraiche or yogurt, you can put a bit of that in to make it a bit creamy and just give it a good mash up. Um, peri peri chicken and match of peas and you could do your, your roast veg or whatever in there or it'd be good with rice but then that one really is perfect to think there i might just have a quarter of that chicken that'll last another three days in the fridge and you can literally use that for whatever you want so it's a pretty basic thing you could do a nice stir fried rice chicken fried rice with it the next day maybe you've got some leftover rice or you could just put it through a salad or in a sandwich but the key thing is there. You've roasted the chicken, and it's going to last three days. You can go whichever way you want. How do you take the backbone out of the chicken? Um, so if you visualize the chicken, flip it onto a board, breast side down, and then right all the way from neck to arse, there will be a bone, which is about half an inch thick, and literally sharp pair of kitchen scissors. You can snip all the way up one side, all the way up the other, and just literally peel it out. And that's it. And then what you would do is take the chicken, flip it back over, and then with the heel of your hand, you just press it down and you'll hear a crack and it'll just flatten out. A bit like when you're at the masseuse and they press your back down, that same action, and you'll hear the same crack. And then that's your chicken spatchcocked. And that's a tip if you want to speed up the, the cooking time of a chicken from maybe an hour and a half to less than an hour. Awesome. What about vegans who are listening? who yep. also need to train, who also want to get their protein in. 
what uh-huh. uh, uh, your favorite high protein vegan okay. meal? Vegan for me, you know, like I think I worked in a fine dining Indian restaurant, and in India, because of religious reasons, a lot of um, people don't eat meat or dairy products as well in some instances and there's some amazing vegan curries where they they just happen to have been vegan for however many hundred years but it's never been labeled as that so things like a delicious chickpea curry um i recently did a really nice not on a curry vibe but for a, more of an asian spin like a teriyaki tofu if you get like a firm tofu block and just literally make soy sauce with some honey squeeze of lime juice um, you can put some grated ginger and garlic, marinate the tofu for maybe half an hour or even overnight and bake it in the fridge. And you get this sort of caramelized, sweet, sticky, savory block of tofu. That is just perfect on top of some, I don't know, you could just use rice noodles, put some veg through it, or even another veggie, uh, vegan option. You could do like a vegan satay, um, veggie noodle stir fry, kind of like a chow mein. And you could just get loads of peanut butter for your for your protein, mix it with some coconut milk, a bit of soy sauce, some sweet chili sauce, some garlic and ginger, quick satay sauce, stir fry some rice noodles, throw in loads of veggies, toss it all through. And then you could even put the tofu through that on the top. Oh, there's so many options. But I think for me, pulses and beans are probably the thing that what's I that, What's most. the first thing? Um, like pulses, like lentils, things like that. They're high in protein. They're packed full of fiber, and they're a great replacement. So if you're doing chili or bolognese, you can do that with lentils. Um, I think it's really underutilized. It's really good value for money, and it comes in a tin, and all you have to do is add it to things. So I had my um, blood work done by a company called Inside Tracker in America a couple mm-hmm. of years ago. Uh, they're out of Boston, and um, they – looked very closely at my blood profile and um from that derived some foods mm. that I should add into my diet that would positively impact different okay. different profiles so um how is your insulin levels looking how is the different growth factors looking and um one of the things that needed impacting was my lipid profile and they said that the single most I had like the total cliche young guy okay. um issue and the the best thing that they suggested was beans, kidney yeah. different types of kidney beans and uh, other tin beans, and they yeah. just said just add that in a couple of uh-huh. times a week, and it fixes downstream the downstream um, blood profile effect. Yeah. It fixes m- most of the things that most wow. people have as a as a problem. They're eating so widely around the world. I don't know that we eat as much of them in in this country as is elsewhere but they are it's like a super well, am i allowed to say it? it's like a superfood they're so good for you it's the protein the fiber but there's so much nutrition and people don't realize like a, a tin of beans is one of your five a day i think about three tablespoons of like chickpeas kidney beans what cannellini beans people don't realize that and this they're, they're a good source of carbohydrate as well so i'll be honest most days for lunch i'll incorporate some beans into a salad or I'll even add them into recipes because I know how how good they are for you. But an amazing source of protein, that's for sure. What's next? Um, Ooh, I was thinking about like a drunken noodles, which is a Thai dish. And this is a good one if you are on a time frame. So if you've got 10 minutes and you want to make something really delicious, literally prawn drunken noodles is rice noodles. You just soak them in boiling water. You need your prawns. You need some eggs. And you need some cherry tomatoes. And you can add any veggies you want into this pak choy. And then for the sauce, it's literally oyster sauce, some soy sauce, some fish sauce, and some sugar. Stir that together. Then you literally fry off some, you can put some shallots or something if you want. Add the prawns in, add the tomatoes in, add the egg, scramble the egg a little bit, any greens. Pour in the um, sauce, add the noodles, stir fry it together. And in less than 10 minutes, you've made like a Thai street food dish, uh, which is proteins, carbs, and delicious. And you can get some veg in there as well. How hot's the pan for that? Oh, really, really hot for that. So anything like stir fries and things, you want it super, super hot. That's why it's always key with thing like a stir fry to get everything prepped because you're not going to have time to start chopping something when the prawns are in. It's all going to be sort of overcooked. Mm. So 
super hot, smoking hot. If you put some oil in, you should see like a shimmer just coming off the pan. Okay. But you can do that. It doesn't have to be prawns. You could use beef. You could use chicken. Things like that just lend themselves well to any any kind of protein. And you reckon that's under 20 minutes from start of prep until food, ah. food is made? Yeah, I've done that on Instagram Live. I think we were done in about 18 minutes or something like that. It's, um, yeah, super easy. And again, you can just adapt it. You don't need to stick to the same recipe every time. Try with pak choy, try with green beans, broccoli, whatever you want. And we should be eating a variety of different fruits and vegetables so it's a good sort of recipe to experiment with new things there's a lot of protein in that one when you've got the eggs in when you've got the meat in when you've got the noodles in yeah there's tons of protein i think that's the other thing like egg noodles people don't realize are a really good source of protein so a nest of egg noodles has become uh i think they're about 40 grams i think there's about seven grams of protein in there so if you'll have a couple of nests of egg noodles for your portion there's like another 15 grams of protein out of nowhere yeah yeah out of nowhere i think there's a lot of hidden protein in food as well isn't there like beans noodles people don't even realize even pasta you know i think 100 grams of pasta's got about seven eight grams of protein in it so it's everywhere what's the uh what's the rules for egg noodles because sometimes i see them fresh sometimes i see you can Mm. i think you can get them frozen as well have you got any rules for that um, I wouldn't say as a rule, just check check the packet instruction. For me with egg noodles, I always just buy the dried ones um, and then you would just cook them in boiling water for about four minutes and then you can add them into to, to, to a stir fry or a sauce. But then they're really good to be chilled as well and kept in the fridge and you can make a delicious salad with it if you just cook some noodles, shred some veg, squeeze a lemon bit of soy sauce and honey, nice zingy sort of noodle salad. But then other types of noodles, you can get rice noodles. So if anyone's sort of not eating dairy, rice noodles are, it's a noodle made of rice. They they mix the rice with water, grind it to a paste, and then form it into noodles and it's dried. And all you have to do is pour boiling water on it to sort of bring them back to life. And you can eat them then and there, or you can add them into sort of stir fries. And then you've got like the straight to wok noodles that you've probably seen in a packet that are kind of soft and they're in a sealed packet and the game that just literally as it says straight into the wok so just read the packaging as well i think a lot of times people buy products and they bypass the thought of oh i'm not i don't need to read that and then they wonder why it hasn't worked it doesn't taste so good but there's generally instructions on on everything we buy now yeah what's next um well i was gonna i sort of went down the teriyaki tofu route but i was gonna do like a teriyaki salmon because i think this is another quick one which people can do in less than 10 minutes really get some salmon put some soy sauce some grated ginger some garlic a squeeze of honey if you've got any mirin if you've got that in the cupboard you can add it if not squeeze a squeeze a lime juice and then literally just soak the salmon in it pop it in the frying pan cook fry the salmon off for probably a couple of minutes on each side pour the rest of the sauce in and because it's got the honey it's going to reduce down and go really sticky and sort of glaze the salmon and I love to do stir fried broccoli and garlic with that, which is just a little bit of sesame oil in with the broccoli, loads of garlic and chili, uh, toss it all together. And then if you want to add carbs, a bit of rice on the side. And that, I mean, I think gone are the days of like we were saying, the chicken and broccoli brigade of boiled chicken uh, and broccoli and plain rice. You can do so much more. I mean, essentially, that would be chicken, broccoli, uh, salmon, broccoli and rice. But by making the simple teriyaki sauce and a bit of sesame oil on the on the broccoli, you totally transform it. Right. What else? What else have we got? Um, oh, I'm trying to think. Is there anything you you'd want to know? To I want to know about steak. I want to be able to do a good yeah. sort of steak of some kind. Perfect. So chimichurri steak is something I love to do. I do it quite often. So chimichurri sauce is sort of a an Argentinian sauce, and it is made with uh, fresh herbs like parsley and coriander. And you use red wine vinegar, olive oil, the chopped herbs, and a bit of oregano, salt and pepper. And it's delicious. And it's really zingy and fresh. Because I think if you go to a restaurant, when when they open again, we don't, hopefully pretty soon, a lot of times steaks serve like quite a creamy and rich sauce. But this is actually really fresh and vibrant. And for me, I would normally go, it depends how lean you want to go. So for anyone listening, fillet steak is the leanest. Um pretty much no fat in that whatsoever then you've got like rumps and sirloins and then a ribeye they're pretty accessible steaks ribeye probably the fattiest of them all what what steak do you like chris what would you order in a restaurant 
Uh, I would tend to order whatever the person sat next to me says I should order. That's okay. I'm one of those. I'll be, what are you? Okay. What are you getting? Yeah. Maybe? What are you having? What are you? Yeah, looks good. Looks looks good. That. How are you having medium? Yeah, medium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love medium. Uh, yeah, I, love I don't really know, man. I mean, what are the? Okay. Uh, how would you break down the different tastes of steak? Can you give us yeah. a a brief sort of steak steak class? Yeah, I mean, something like a fillet steak. There's very little. If you, this is the best way to think about steaks. Fat is flavor. That re- fat is a carrier of flavor. That is why things like beef dripping taste so good. Goose fat. It, Fat is just rammed. For, there's more flavor in fat than flesh. So if you've got a fatty cut of steak like a ribeye, it's going to taste more beefy than a fillet steak, which doesn't have as much in it. So things like a, a fatty ribeye steak, that's where something like a chimichurri sauce, you need that acidity to cut through the, the fattiness that you're going to get in your mouth. Whereas like a fillet steak, because there isn't any fat, that's why like a nice creamy sauce, like a mushroom sauce or a peppercorn goes well with it. But I think the easiest way to look at it is like fillet being the leanest, rump steak, probably one down, and then sirloin and then ribeye. Ribeye definitely packs the most flavor, but then again, it's the fattiest one, one of them all. But I would say for me, rump steak or ribeye steak with a chimichurri sauce, season the steak on each side. Drizzle the steak with oil, not the pan. It stops it all splashing around. And you always want your steak to be at room temperature. And that goes with anything you're cooking protein-wise because if you take a steak out of the fridge, if you think about it, the ins- that, that steak's going to be about three degrees all the way through. So if you put that steak in a like – if it's quite a thick steak or whatever, and you pop it in a really hot griddle pan or frying pan, whatever, the outside of the steak's going to be caramelized but the inside of the steak is going to take longer to come up to that temperature. So it's basically going to be blue and raw in the, like properly raw in the middle, but really caramelized on the outside. Whereas if that steak's at room temperature, the inside of the steak is already at about 18 degrees. So you get an even cook on it. The outside, by the time the outside's caramelized, the inside will be nice and sort of medium rare. And again, with like chicken and stuff, if you're frying a piece of chicken and it's freezing cold out the well not freezing but like really cold out the fridge, by the time the inside the heat penetrates to the middle, the outside's going to be burnt. So always have your steak and your meat at room temperature when you cook it. So season the steak, salt and pepper, really hot pan. In the pan, don't I never mess with it. Once it's in, I only ever turn it once. A normal sort of thickness of the steak, probably a couple of minutes. Flip it over. And just make sure it's nice and caramelized on the bottom. And by say caramelized, I mean like that sort of golden crispiness. That's something called the Maillard reaction. And it's the sugars caramelizing. Flip it over another couple of minutes. And then if you want to be really indulgent, when it's just about done, you can add butter into the pan and baste the steak in butter. And it will just soak up those buttery goodness flavors. Um, but I, to be honest, if you're doing a chimichurri sauce, I, I don't tend to put the butter in. But the chimichurri, just simply finely chopped uh, coriander and parsley, some oregano, red wine vinegar, drizzle of olive oil. And that for me is just a perfect steak steak supper. What would you serve that with? Um, you could do it with, for me, I would think what, what time of year am I eating? If it was the summer or, sorry, spring coming up, I'd probably do some asparagus. I'd go for, think about what's in season I love broccoli with it or like a lovely rocket salad, something like that. Sweet potato wedge is, again, a bit of a healthier option. Um, but one of my favorite ways with a chimichurri steak is a ciabatta bread and just make like the ultimate steak sandwich and all of the flavor just drifts into the ciabatta and you've got that sort of herby, spicy sauce. Unbelievable. And a top tip here, anyone making a steak, always cut it against the grain when you cut it because if you think about the grain of a meat, I'm trying to think of the best way to put this across. If you want ultimate tenderness, cutting against the grain means you're going to bite down on short fibers. So they're just going to sort of collapse in your mouth. Whereas if you go with the long way, you're going to have these big, long, stringy fibers Uh, that you're essentially chewing on. Yeah, of course. Yeah. That makes so So, much sense. Because if you think about like some spaghetti hanging upside down as the fibers, if you cut the long way with the spaghetti, you've got them long strands in your mouth and it's chewy. But if you cut against them, then the fibers are like 
the loads of little bits of spaghetti that way and they just break straight down so that can you could cook the steak perfectly but if you don't cut it against the grain you could still be you chewing on it make the best steak in the world but knack it with your knife and fork once you sit down at the table yeah literally so always cut the steak against the grain dude i love that that's that's my i think that might be my favorite hack to come yeah. out of today uh any other bits any other sort of final thoughts or things that you that you think people need to know i think people just need to for anyone that's a bit of a novice in the kitchen anyone can cook delicious food i think everyone's got the ability to do it you've just got to give it a go and have some confidence to do it i mean in lockdown i've done all these live cook-alongs with families and children and i'm getting messages from parents and kids who've never cooked before these recipes that we're talking about easy enough for children to cook so I think they're easy enough for everyone to cook. And at the end of the day, it's just food. If it, don't be scared by it. If it doesn't quite work out, you can try again next time. But I guess the other one is if anyone's got any questions or they want to know more, they can message me and I'll get back to everyone that has a, any questions on food or whatever. Where should they go? Uh, just straight to my Instagram. If, if anyone, I mean, there's recipes all over the place on there, but if anyone had anything more specific, you can just send me a message, but it's just at Chris Baber, which is B-A-B-E-R. If you can't, no one knows my surname. It depends where I go in the country. It's either Baba, Baba, Baber. <laughs> um, but yeah, just jump onto my Instagram. There's, there's food everywhere on there, recipes, advice, all the stuff we covered. Dude, I wonder how many people are going to have a more tasty week coming up because we've had this conversation tonight. Oh, man, I hope so. And I, I had one question for you, actually. Hit well, me. two. Hit me. Number one, last meal, what would it be? You're allowed three courses. Oh, God. Okay, so as a starter, I'm a big fan of a sort of a pill-pill prawn type mm. thing, um, like garlic, maybe on a, maybe a sort of ciabatta on the side. That would be quite nice. Nice. Um, as a main... So tough. As a main, I would I'd be tempted to go for steak. Um, I, yeah. I I I do tend to enjoy it with mashed potato, like some nice sort of um, like a classic sort of British Sunday, basically yeah. a Sunday a Sunday uh, lunch. Dinner and then steak. man, it's it's got to be a crumble to finish yeah. up for 100%. me. Hundred percent, I'm all over a crumble. Hot crumble, cold custard. I love that contrast. So good. Yeah. So good. And the other question, what's your favorite sandwich? Oh, man. Tough one. So my, my, my sa- Johnny, uh, one of the guys that's regularly on the show, he has a heuristic around buying sandwiches for protein, and he says that you should look to try and get a good sandwich has 10 to 15% of the calories from protein. He says that's, okay. that's, that's a realistic uh, ratio yeah. to find. So I've used that heuristic a few times. If I was in a in boots or whatever, I just tend to gravitate right. towards the the chicken salad sandwich. So that's a fairly basic yeah. one, but I've had some really good uh, like club sandwiches. So mm. like the you know the triple yeah. triple bread, the crusts are already gone off the bread. The yeah. little um, triangle. Someone skewered it with a uh, a, a stick, and you've got some. Stick. Yeah, yeah, and it's you need to eat it in like three different goes. But that's yeah. I think that's my. What about yours? What would yours be? <laughs> The the sandwich one's hard. I, I, I gravitate between leftover Christmas dinner sandwich, like the turkey, the stuffed and pigs and blankets, or hot beef and gravy in a soft white bun. With some maybe a, some caramelized onions or something like that oh, as well. Yes. Now we're talking maybe a bit of mustard and just I want the gravy dripping everywhere, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I could literally talk. Well, I, I say I could talk about food all day. I do. It's my job. I love it. Um, but do you know what? I love the way that food brings people together. We, we came on here just to talk about food, and we've managed it for like an hour and a half. And it it feels like we're only just getting started with it. But it's it's a like you say, it's an it's something that we need to do. We do do. But I think people are. It's so much of a habit and a routine that people don't take a step back to look at what else food does mean to us as people and how important it is and the benefits it can give us as well. Weirdly, the things that have the biggest impact on our lives are the ones that are so close, they're staring us in the face and we don't look at it. So few people have a sleep routine. So few people that I know actually understand I need to go to bed 
at the same time. I need to wake up at yeah. the same time. I need to have dark blinds, ideally blackout blinds, two sets yeah. of curtains. My bedroom needs to be colder than I think it needs to be, and I should yeah. have a, a shower before I go to bed. They don't understand that maybe some magnesium supplements would help or some CBD yeah. supplements would help, that not having food just before you're about to go to bed is a good... All of this stuff, so, and that's just mm. sleep. And then when yeah. you think, right, okay, I understand, need to understand about hydration. I need to understand about how I spend my mornings, how I yeah. wake up, my caffeine consumption before I get out of bed on a morning. People having the coffee machine ready for them to wake up yeah. so that they can wake up and have a coffee when their adenosine system isn't active for 90 minutes. What you want yeah. is salt, lemon, water, ice cold glass, get your adrenal system moving. That's what's okay. active for the first 90 minutes. And then if you choose to have a coffee after 90 minutes or uh, two hours or so, that's when your adenosine system comes online and you'll get... So basically the first coffee you have in the morning, easiest hack for anyone that wants to reduce their caffeine intake and you can't let go of the the balloon tether yeah. that is your first coffee. Just make it a decaf, make it okay. a good a good quality decaf, and then you're going to not you're going to fulfill the I need a coffee yeah. to wake up sensation because it's a habit. Mm. But yeah. you're not you're that caffeine isn't hitting your system, so you're just adding to the total volume of caffeine you're consuming whilst not contributing yeah. to the effect you want, which is the awakeness. Much mm. more likely if you get. There's a company called LMNT who okay. uh, m my buddy owns, and uh, they do flavored salts. So it's electrolyte salts that uh, athletes would use, but they're also amazing as the first drink of the morning. And they do okay. a, a mango habanero. They do a lemon and chili. Wow. They do a chocolate salt, raspberry salt. Um, and yeah. this with a best part of a pint of cold water out mm. of the fridge on a morning with a little squeeze of lemon juice, it takes your head, like lemon, ha uh, mango habanero yeah. with a little bit of lemon takes your head off more than a coffee yeah. ever will. Wow. And um, you just awake, man. It, it's a, it's a I'm real gonna buzz. I'm going to try that. Yeah, I'll, um, give me, give me your, your address and I'll get Joel yeah. to send you, to oh, send you perfect. a bunch of that stuff down. Um, yeah. Man, I, uh, I've I've been really enlightened by your yeah. love for food. I don't think I know anyone else. Mm. I don't have any other friends yeah. that, that love it as much as yeah. you do. And I really... I really hope that we've kind of showed people that it, it can be something that they can invest yeah. their time into and it doesn't just need to be the, the annoying bit before that they're not hungry anymore. Yeah. No, you're bang. I mean, it, it's funny because it's just all like mindset. For me, that's the one thing that is the fun bit of the day. I'm like two o'clock in the afternoon. I was like, oh, I can't wait to make me dinner. I'm looking at the watch sort of thing. It's um, But again, it's just what you're into and hopefully we've given people a bit, a bit of inspiration to get in the kitchen and, just prove it can be easy to make something delicious. Awesome, man. So at Chris Baber on Instagram, and yeah. if people want to hassle you, and also all of the recipes and stuff we've yeah. gone through will be on there. Yeah, wicked. Dude, awesome. Thank you. Mate, thank you so much. <laughs>